Chapter 15 Escape Mark didn't lie, but he wasn't ready yet to tell the truth. When the court met again on Friday afternoon, no one was really surprised when he again refused to answer the judge's questions. I'm not going to answer that, he said time after time. But everyone was shocked by the recording that was played. Reggie's eyes opened wide when she heard Moldano speak of killing her. The judge agreed that Mark was in great danger and returned him to custody. There was a surprise, though, when Slick Moeller came before the judge. True to his word, the reporter refused to name the person who gave him private information. Well, Mr. Moeller, said the judge, if I can send a child to prison for refusing to tell what he knows, I can do the same for you. Slick knew more than anyone about crime in Memphis, but he had never been inside a prison. Now it was his turn. Back in his prison room, Mark was ready for his plan. For half an hour, he ran around his room until his heart was going very fast and his face was red and hot. When he heard Doreen's key, he lay on the floor closed his eyes, and put his thumb in his mouth. Mark, shouted Doreen when she saw him. Mark, oh, you poor kid. She ran from the room to get help and was back in a few seconds with another guard. Mark was worried about this, said Doreen. He's in shock, like his little brother. Look, his skin is all wet, and his heart is going so fast. Stay here. I'll call an ambulance, said the other guard. We need to get him to hospital. Everything was confused after that. Nobody wanted a boy to die in prison. When the ambulance came, the guards signed papers to send Mark to hospital and he was taken at once to St. Peter's. More papers. There were nurses everywhere, and everyone was in a hurry. A nurse moved Mark to a bed. Sign this, said the ambulance men. And be quick, we have another case waiting. The nurse signed. The men left. And the nurse went to answer a phone. Mark opened his eyes and saw he was alone. He jumped off the bed and ran into a hall. Nobody noticed him. He disappeared into an empty office and found a phone. Reggie, he said quickly when she answered the phone. I'm in St. Peter's. I can't talk now. Please, come and get me. Don't tell anyone. I'll be in the car park. Mark knew how to hide in the hospital. He moved quickly and quietly and found his way to the car park. When Reggie's car arrived, he climbed in and hid on the floor. Drive, Reggie, he said. Drive anywhere. Let's go. I'll explain later. When the nurse came back, Mark was not there. Someone's moved him, she thought, and hurried off to another job. When Foltrig's men arrived with papers to take Mark to New Orleans, they checked the prison, and then checked the hospital. Only then did people realize that he was gone. He's what? cried Diane. Go find him, said McThune. But by then, Mark and Reggie were on the road. Where are we going? asked Reggie. Listen, Reggie, said Mark. I've been thinking. What if Romy told me a lie? What if the body isn't where he said? Then I'd be safe. 
we need to check. We need to go to New Orleans. Chapter 16 New Orleans On Saturday, the news was out. Everyone was looking for Mark. When Barry Moldano heard, he was wild with fear. He went straight to tell his uncle. The kids disappeared, he said. What's he going to do now? I need to move the body. Help me? Give me two men. You're stupid, 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 said Uncle Johnny. I'll give you two men, but don't get caught. I'll do it tonight, said Barry, when it's dark. Reggie and Mark reached New Orleans on Saturday afternoon. They drove all night, stopping only to sleep a few hours in the car. Reggie knew it was wrong. She knew the cops and the FBI would be looking for them. They talked through the night about Memphis and Mark's life there, about his school and his friends. Then Mark said sadly, If the body is there, I can't go back to Memphis, can I? So they talked about the witness protection plan. Reggie still had no idea where they were going. We have to find Clifford's house, said Mark. The body's there? Are you crazy? It's there, said Mark, under his boat in the garage. They found the house late on Saturday afternoon. The streets were quiet, so they parked the car and walked round to the back of the house. All was silent. There's the garage, said Mark quietly. This is crazy, said Reggie. We'll wait until dark. Reggie looked at her watch. Midnight. They were hiding in the tall grass behind the house. She was tired and had pains in her legs. It was time to move. Slowly, they crawled through the grass towards the garage. Reggie was shaking. She was afraid of snakes. Suddenly, Mark stopped. There's a light in there, he whispered. There's someone there. Stay here, Reggie. He crawled silently to a window. There was the boat. And it was moving. He saw the shapes of three men. Okay, Baldano, said one of the men. Where do we dig? Mark's heart was in his mouth. He crawled back to Reggie. It's Maldano, he whispered. They're digging up the body. What do we do now? Oh, no, said Reggie. I told you this was crazy. Let me think. And suddenly, she knew what to do. She crawled in the other direction, towards the house next door. With her shoe, she broke a window. Suddenly, the night was no longer silent. Bells rang everywhere. Lights went on in the house next door. Voices were shouting. A man appeared with a gun. He shot wildly into the dark. Look, called Mark. They're leaving. Maldano and his men ran out of the garage and disappeared. Reggie crawled back. It was another hour before the confusion ended. Police came to the house next door. More shouting, more lights. Mark and Reggie stayed hidden behind Clifford's garage. Then all was silent again. Come on, said Mark. We have to look. The lock on the garage door was broken. In the dark, they moved towards the boat. Next to it, there was a hole. 
In the hole was a plastic bag. We have to look, said Mark again. And they opened the bag. The horrible, dead face of the senator stared up at them. The smell was terrible. Reggie felt sick, but now they knew the truth. Come on, she said. I have to make a phone call. Chapter 17 Waiting It was Sunday morning. Everyone was waiting. In Johnny's office, Moldano was waiting nervously for night to come. He would have to try again. At his home, Foltrig was waiting angrily for news of Mark. He needed him in court on Monday. At the city airport, Mark and Reggie were waiting. They were in a private room with Detective Truman of the FBI. What time will they be here? asked Reggie. Soon, said Truman. They left an hour ago. Will they have the papers? asked Reggie. Sure, said Truman. Everything you asked for. Mark was at a window, watching a jet take off. He thought he would like flying. Maybe he would be a pilot. He's a brave kid, said Truman to Reggie. A black FBI jet landed. Is it them? Mark asked excitedly. The door opened, the stairs came down, and McThune appeared. He was followed by Diane, then Dr. Greenway, carrying Ricky. Truman led Mark and Reggie to meet them. Reggie watched while Mark and Diane held each other close. Then she turned to McThune. You'll take Ricky to a hospital? She asked. Agreed. We have a room booked in Phoenix, a private hospital. They're waiting for Ricky. When he's better, they can choose where to live? Agreed, said McThune. It's all in the papers. I just need you and Ms. Sway to sign. Mom, said Mark, I've been thinking, what about Australia? They have real cowboys there. I saw it in a film once. No more films for you, Mark, laughed Diane. No more TV, just books from now on. And she signed the papers. Reggie watched as Mark and Diane walked back to the plane. Suddenly, Mark turned. Aren't you coming, Reggie? He asked. No, Mark, I can't. He bit his lip. I'll never see you again, will I? She shook her head. There were tears in her eyes. I love you, Mark. I'll miss you. I'll miss you too, he said. And for once, he was not ashamed to cry in public. I'll never see you again, said Mark again, almost to himself. He dried his wet eyes with the back of his hand and walked slowly to join his mother. At the top of the stairs, he turned for one last look. Minutes later, as the plane moved away, Truman said again, He's a brave kid. Reggie looked at the plane and said nothing. Then she turned and told him what he wanted to know. The body is in the garage behind Jerome Clifford's house, she said. 886 East Brookline. Thanks, Reggie, Truman said, suddenly ready to leave. Don't thank me, said Reggie, looking into the clouds. Thank Mark. <laughs>